Willkommen, liebe Freunde von Yad Vashem, sehr geehrte Botschafterin der Deutschen Republik in Israel, Frau Wassum Rainer, Damen und Herren, dear friends and shalom chaverim. Ich bin Ruth Orr und ich bin die Direktorin von die Deutsche Freundeskreis von Yad Vashem in Deutschland und auch zuständig für das Arbeit von Yad Vashem in die deutschsprachigen Länder. Ähm, und ich leite ein kleines Büro hier in Berlin und ich freue mich, dass heute meine Kolleginnen Lena Kraus und Margit Emmes heute nicht nur dabei sind, wie immer, aber auch sichtbar. Und vielleicht könnt ihr einfach Hallo sagen. <lacht> da dieses Event auf Englisch ist, werde ich weiter auf Englisch sprechen. Und ich freue mich, wie Sie alle wissen, weil ich bin, äh, das ist meine Muttersprache. So, welcome everybody. Today is our last talk in the series of Behind the Scenes at Yad Vashem. We were so disappointed um, when all our plans for 2020 had to be postponed next year that we thought, what could we do to bring Yad Vashem to you when you can't go to Yad Vashem yourselves? And that's how the idea began to get some of our colleagues from Yad Vashem to give you an insight into their work, their challenges, um, the, the highs and the lows of what they do. And, um, and that's how this Zoom series was born. Um, we've heard already from five different speakers. They've covered subjects from running the world's largest Holocaust archive to managing um, the challenges of international diplomacy in Yad Vashem. I hope you can hear me despite the alarm going past. And today is our last session. For each session, we have tried to match up a moderator together with our expert from Yad Vashem. And you'll have a sneak preview of tonight's moderator sitting right next to me. Um, and we've tried to match people who have similar interests and similar areas of expertise And therefore, it's a huge pleasure for me to introduce to you Benita von Malzahn tonight. Thank you. Um, Benita has been head of cultural engagement at Volkswagen since 2011. And she has brokered creative partnerships between VW and some of the world's most famous and most significant art institutions, for instance, the MoMA in New York and the National Gallery in Berlin. She's also been an incredible supporter of the work of Yad Vashem and a key player in terms of the um, incredibly generous donation that uh, Volkswagen gave last year to Yad Vashem. And she is even a member of the Freundeskreis. So you have a halo over your head. Um, Benita is also comes from the visual arts originally and was working as a conservator and as an art advisor. So when we had the idea of inviting Eliad for tonight's talk, immediately we thought that the Benita is the right person. Thank you so much, Benita, for um, agreeing to do this tonight. And I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ruth. Yeah, I'm really um, honored to be doing this and I'm really happy, um, Eliad, to have the pleasure to introduce you because in the end it's about what you're doing and um, what you're going to present us tonight. So you're the curator and director of the art department within the museum division of Yad Vashem. And you once very rightly said, the words Holocaust art is a bit of an oxymoron because nobody really expects Holocaust art, art to be done in the Holocaust. And I have to say, my first experience was in 2016 when the exhibition in Berlin happened and for the first time, I think, um, pieces from Yad Vashem were allowed to travel and came to the museum in Berlin. And I saw the exhibition here and I was really deeply impressed. Um, I have to say there was a lot of paper there and Ruth already mentioned I was a paper conservator uh, years ago. And so I have a big love for paper anyway, but also the way the art was done, why it was done, all that you're going to tell us about. So I think it's all yours now, and I'm really excited to listening to your presentation. Thank you, Benita. A very nice uh, 
to, to, to see you today and I look forward to our conversation. And I would like to say hello to all the friends of Yad Vashem in Germany and elsewhere. And also I recognize some um, names of, of personal friends, so I say hello. Uh, but um, I know our program is really very busy. I have lots of things to tell you, so I should start immediately uh, by showing you my presentation. So I will share my screen uh, in a minute, in a minute, what? here. So here is the presentation and we'll go. Um, do you see the presentation? No. Yeah, yeah, yes. we can see it. Ah, you can see it. Okay, so I but just the only... the... hi Shaya. Hi. <laughs> um I just have one and the the overview is, is a bit different than usually. So I'm Sorry. So, okay, if it's, do you see it properly? Yes, perfect. It's okay. Okay, so, so I'll do it. It's, I don't understand why I don't see the full screen and I don't see the little icon in order to put the full screen. Can you look at the view side? You, you have to go to the bottom and uh, as you do in PowerPoint, uh, oh. see me. תלחצי למטה על הטלוויזיה שמגדילה את זה שם, את הסקרין ששם לך... לא, אבל זה לא שם. אני לא רואה את זה, זה לא מופיע, אף פעם לא קרה לי. אז רגע, לא, אז יש לך... את לא רואה את זה בגלל שאת צריכה להרים שם, בגלל שזה מסתיר לך את זה. אה, אולי. זה של ה... אוקיי, אבל, אתה יודע, אני לא רוצה... It never happened to me. <laughs> I give every week almost. <laughs> I can't, I'm sorry. Um, I, I prepared it in advance so we won't waste time. And now I don't find the, I'm not able to, to see the, the full screen. Oh, maybe like this. No, no. But no. I think it's good. it looks good. Okay, so we'll, we'll just start, okay? So, um, uh, today, I want to invite you to uh, a tour behind the scenes of uh, the art department, which I have the privilege uh, to, to, to lead. Uh, and um, so first of all, we have an art museum. And some of you might have seen, uh, you know, our permanent display. In general, um, you can see it after um, after uh, um, visiting the History Museum, on your way, um, you can see the Art Museum. So, so here it is. But in general, when you see all the artworks, you don't necessarily know the stories behind the works and the whole process it took for us to receive uh, the works. So from the moment we receive an artwork until it is put on display, oh. there's a lot of time oh, that um, Shaya, bevakasha, uh, and uh, so, so there's a whole process that takes uh, place, and uh, and I want to show you and to tell you a bit about this process that takes place behind every artwork that is on display. Uh, but before that, I will uh, just explain about our collection. So we have um, almost. 13,000 artworks, and we have the largest uh, collection related to the Holocaust in the world. And our collection is uh, made of, uh, comprises paintings, drawings, prints, and sculptures. Three periods, pre-Holocaust, we want to commemorate artists who were murdered during the Holocaust. So art that is not necessarily connected to the Holocaust, to the Holocaust by their themes, but they are connected because the artists were murdered and this is the only way we can um, honor the memory of these artists. So this is the first part. The second part, 
And the main part, what makes the core of our collection is uh, the, the part uh, created during the Holocaust. And we define, uh, you know, we have a broad definition. We follow the definition of, the, of our history museum. Uh, so from the rise of the Nazis to power to the end of the DP camps. Uh, so, so all these works we um, consider part of the Holocaust. And uh, so, as I said, this is the main part of our collection. And this is also what makes our specificity, you know, because these are really treasures. Uh, the next um, part is the um, post Holocaust. So art that was created by survivors, by witnesses, can be second generation, there's the third generation, even today we talk of fourth generation, and also all kinds of other artists. Um, now, I, I just, you know, I want to explain very briefly the missions of our department, of the art department, as part of the Yad Vashem, and as you know, Yad Vashem uh, is dedicated to Holocaust remembrance. And what we do is, first of all, we collect, we preserve, we research, we display, and we share the information. And today I will tell about four stories like case studies uh, in which I will try to illustrate how we attempt to accomplish these missions, okay? So now I start with the first, the first uh, story, uh, and it, this is connected to Esther Loye, an artist from um, originally, originally from Latvia, but she was active in the Kovno ghetto. And what you see here is how we received this this uh, year in the midst of the lockdown, we received uh, a long awaited collection uh, from the United States. We received um, from the artist's uh, daughter, part of, of uh, her collection. And, uh, and so uh, we, and it came from, from the US, as I said. And so we, we received all these, um, packed and wrapped uh, uh, works. And, and you see um, me here with our collection manager, Michal Feiner, uh, and, and we try to, to understand the scope of the collection. It's about 400 pieces, so 400 new pieces uh, that are added to a collection that we have already from the artist. Uh, just to explain, this is a long process. We have, first of all, to have a long, to have a survey about the works and you see to unwrap and, 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 to, and to register and to, and also to try to understand to which period each work does belong because she's an artist and I will tell a bit about her story. She's an artist that um, survived and she created art throughout all of the stages of her life. So we have to make uh, some order in, in the collection that we received that is not necessarily dated. Uh, so just a few words about Esther Lurie. Um, and you can see here a self-portrait from the Kovno ghetto. And you can see her with her sister. This is Esther, this is her sister Shifra. Uh, in Latvia, because as I said, she was born uh, in Latvia. She made Aliyah, she made, so, so she lived in Israel uh, in the 30s. Uh, and, uh, but at the end of the 30s, she decided she wanted to learn more and uh, to study stage design. And she went to uh, Belgium to study. And while there, because it was the summer and she had vacation, she went to visit her sister who was in uh, Kovno. And there she was caught by the war. It was 1939 and, uh, and, and, she, and she was later caught by the war and she couldn't go back to Israel where she was living. 
And there she became like, she was an outsider because she was not part of the place. She had no family of her own. And so she became a witness. She did what she knew, meaning to document through art. So she drew whatever she saw. And this is what you can see here. And what I'm showing you now, it's not from the new collection, it's from the collection we already have in Yad Vashem. Um, so she, she, um, she went inside the ghetto and she started recording what she was seeing. And uh, her works really have a tremendous historical value because it's a first-hand testimony and it's a visual one. And those of you that have been in the History Museum might remember that in the part uh, dealing with the Kovno ghetto, a lot of the works are from Esther Loya because she provides us with the visual um, materials that are so lacking when we are talking about uh, the Holocaust, because we have to bear in mind that most of the works that reached, uh, not the works, most of the visual materials we have come from the perpetrator side, some from the Nazis. The Nazis uh, left photographs, but not tell the story we want to tell uh, in Yad Vashem. We want to tell the story from the victim side. So, um, so, so this one, this is why the works from Esther Luya and other artists are so important. Uh, when, while she was recording in the, the Kovno ghetto, her activity came to the ears of um, the Judenrat, the Ältestenrat there, um, the Council of Elders, and, and she was encouraged by um, Dr. Chaim Nachman Shapiro and also Avram Tori, who served as the secretary of the Ältestenrat, to, to continue and record. And what is so interesting is that Abraham Tori, for instance, he wrote a chronicle about life of the Kovno ghetto. And Esther Luria was recording the same things, but through painting uh, or drawing. And, and, and so, so it's really uh, com complementary. And um, um, Abraham Tori helped Esther, uh, first of all, to get materials and also to go to all kinds of places where she could um, document. And um, she gave him some of her works uh, that uh, served him for his uh, documentation process because he wanted these visual materials and, and he uh, hid these works before the ghetto was liquidated. And Esther took all of her works and she also uh, hid them. And she said that uh, the idea of where to hide her works did not her, give her rest. In the end, she um, ordered some ceramic jars from friends of hers that were working in the pottery um, workshop. And, and she had jars and she put her works in jars and she buried the jars with uh, some 200 of her works in uh, the garden next to where her sister was living. And, um, but when she came back after the war, she didn't find the, the, the treasure, she didn't find her works. So the works that survived, survived with Avram Tori. Uh, who also survived and, and went to the hiding place and found the works. Now you can see here, so this work that you see here in color, the main entry gate to the ghetto uh, and the bridge to Slobodka, uh, you can see it has two dates. And why is that? It's because she recreated some of the works she found uh, so, because she had photographs, she had uh, left photographs with Abraham Tori. So, based on this, she recreated some of the works that were lost. So, this explains uh, the two dates. Uh, later on, she was um, sent to uh, the, um, the camp of Stutthof and Leibich, and there she also managed to uh, draw even though she had no materials and uh, 
whenever she was caught, she was beaten. But at the same time, there were some uh, people that, um, that saw her talent and some uh, Germans that uh, used her talent so that she would create for them portraits of their family members or something for their girlfriends. And like that, it, she could obtain some more food and uh, it helped her to survive. So it was both a threat to draw because uh, she, she, it was dangerous, but at the same time, it also helped her um, to survive. We don't have that much time, so I won't get into all of the details. Uh, I'll just um, uh, show you uh, that after the war, she dedicated her life to, uh, to commemorate uh, the victims, all the people that she lost, and uh, to, she dedicated her life to Holocaust remembrance. And when there was the Eichmann trial, she was there and she continued to do what she knew, uh, meaning uh, to record and to document. And as you see it mentioned here, uh, these works are not part of our collection, but I wanted to show you how this uh, um, remarkable a lady dedicated her life um, to, to Holocaust remembrance. She also wrote um, her memoirs uh, and gave a, you know, every time possible testimony. So here you see what we've seen now was one story of you know, what it means to collect. So when, when we receive a collection, um, it's, not, it's not just about you know, the registration and that's it. There's a lot of research connected to it. And even, uh, and, and we have to date, we have to, to organize. So th this was one aspect. Second aspect, aspect we'll see now with this uh, very special uh, story of um, a painting by Felix Nussbaum. And uh, so one day we received an email, it was already some years ago, um, almost 10 years ago, we received an email of a man from Belgium saying he has this painting. So you see it here before conservation and after conservation. Uh, he said he owns this painting, it belonged to his father and he would like uh, to sell it. So first of all, we uh, checked uh, Felix Nussbaum's catalogue raisonné uh, and we saw that this painting existed. So, I mean, it was, was known as a because there was a photograph of it and there was a preparatory drawing, uh, but the whereabouts of the painting uh, were unknown it was believed to be lost. So it was interesting. Uh, and, but we, we wanted to know if it's genuine. We wanted to know if it's, it's not a forgery, if it's a true painting and um, an authentic one. So uh, we, we, for, we thought of contacting our colleagues from the Osnabrück, um, from Osnabrück, you know, there is uh, a Felix Nussbaum house there designed by the famous architect Daniel Libeskind, a very special um, museum. And um, so while, um, so, so, so they have the biggest collection of Nussbaums because they, uh, this is um, the artist's hometown uh, where, where he was born and they, have the whole museum dedicated to him and, and um, uh, more than 200 works. So, so we said we should ask them what they think and probably uh, the man who contacted us probably contacted them as well. Uh, so there, um, I, uh, so I just called uh, Dr. Inge Jena, who was the former director of the Felix Nussbaum House. And she was really a, a special uh, person. Uh, sorry, um, very nice lady. You can see her here. And um, 
it is very uh, sad to say that she passed away and uh, really we regret very much. Uh, but so she would, so, so I, I, I called her and I said, what do you say about this um, painting? Uh, are you interested? Uh, will you want to buy it? Because it will be silly that we, you know, at the end of the day, we don't want to fight against colleagues. You know, we, we, we are doing, we all want to preserve uh, art and culture and, and the memory of Felix Nussbaum. So, uh, so we wouldn't want to go one against each other. And she said, no, you know, we will not buy it. And, and she said there, there had been um, two very uh, sad cases of forgeries in Germany. And uh, the Felix Nussbaum house had uh, bought two forgeries. Uh, and you can see here this candle that, um, you know, it's from, uh, from, from the German press. Um, th this man had... Um, forged um, paintings by uh, Felix Nussbaum. And, and she said uh, she will not, in this case, she will not buy the painting because um, she, she, she doesn't know this man who is selling it and it's not appropriate. So we asked her whether she'll be ready to, to uh, check the painting for us and tell uh, us about uh, her opinion because, of course, you know, uh, she's an expert uh, in the field and regarding Felsbaum. So she very generously she agreed and we traveled to Belgium and she checked the painting and she told us that it looked to her authentic. So uh, we bought the painting for, for a very good price. And you can see here how the painting arrived. Uh, this is in the conservation lab. We, we opened you know, the, the, the painting. It was, it was really not well preserved. It had been nailed on the wall. There had been holes on, um, all around it. And so we discovered it for the first time here uh, is our uh, former conservator Dodo Shinhav, who was um, a Holocaust survivor, sadly he passed away already, and Ella Lubov, uh, our conservator. And, and so it went through conservation and especially cleaning. It was stretched, of course, on, uh, and, and it was uh, cleaned. And after it was cleaned, we discovered this very special um inscription on the book we were not able to see it before that because it was covered with so much dust and you can see here it's written felka and felka is nussbaum's wife so inside of the painting there was this very special uh, uh clue but we were not able to read it until uh, it was cleaned and it, it provided us with another uh, element to say that for sure it was an authentic painting. Also, uh, our conservator made all kinds of um, tests, you know, uh, with the pigments and, and, and the canvas and everything uh, was, uh, you know, uh, fit the, fit the, um, the, the time. So, it, it was uh, now we could conclude it's uh, a genuine painting by Felix Nussbaum. And you know, the next step is to display and share. So you can see uh, it here on display. And uh, I saw that my friend um, Jorgen Kaumkert uh, um, is also listening today. So I must say that when he came to Yad Vashem for the first time, um, he told me a lot of very uh, interesting elements about the painting. Uh, it shed light on, on, the on the significance of this very enigmatic painting. I, I don't, will not talk about it now because 
we don't have the time, it will last too long. Uh, just I can say that we, can, we could talk about this painting for hours because it's so complex and so interesting. And I can uh, mention that when um, your um, Minister of Culture, uh, Dr. Monica Gretos came uh, to Yad Vashem, we talked for maybe half an hour or more on this painting. So it was really wonderful, uh, a wonderful experience. Now, um, another story I want to uh, share with you. Uh, it's the story of this portrait um, by Grégoire Michon. And uh, this is the portrait of the poet and writer and philosopher Benjamin Fontaine, originally from uh, Romania, but who was active in France and uh, was murdered in Auschwitz. Um, while I was working on the exhibition, Last Portrait Painting for Posterity, dealing with portraits dur during the Holocaust, uh, I wanted to use the poem by um, Fondan as really at, at the very entrance of the exhibition. So, um, so, so of course I was reading a lot about Benjamin Fondan and his work and his biography. And one day my colleague came to me uh, with a catalog of uh, auction and said, well, look, if there, are, there is anything that is of interest and that we should buy in the next auction in Paris. Uh, and he told me, well, there are all kinds of stuff, but it was not very interesting. So I was looking uh, at the catalog, uh, you know, and I don't know why exactly. All of a sudden, I was caught by uh, this head. And you see it's written, it was written in the catalog, so um, the head of a man, so it's unidentified, and Grégoire Michon, and it is undated. So, but the minute I saw it, I said, well, but it's Fondan. You know, I was so much into Fondan at, at this particular time. So, of course, I, recogn I recognized him as if I had recognized a friend. And I was sure about it. And also you can see he has a very special uh, face. So once you know him, you cannot forget him. So for me, it was obvious that it was him because uh, it was uh, considered as unidentified. It was very easy to buy it for a very good price. And the minute we received the portrait, we of course started doing some research. So first of all, I checked and just by Googling, you know, Michons and Fontaine, I found that the two knew each other. And it's not a surprise because both of them came from Romania to Paris. And, but what I saw, and it was very easy to find it, um, they were friends. The next step was that I contacted my friend, um, my friend, um, uh, Dr. Monique Jutrin, who is the specialist of Benjamin Fontaine. And I told her, what do you know about the relationship between Fontaine and Michons? And she said, well, I know they were friends. I don't know much more about it, uh, but I know there's a portrait uh, that was done by, um, by Michons. I know that because after the war, uh, the widow of Fondan wanted to publish a, a, a book in his memory, and she she wrote to her uh, to the editor to the publisher. She wrote that she has a very good portrait uh, by Michons, dated from forty two or forty three. So I told her, "Well, Monique, you know what." I think we found that portrait. And she, she was so, I mean, she, she, we were both so excited. Uh, so now I've, I got a document and I had a date. It was 42 or 43. So when I bought the portrait, I didn't know 
that it was done even during the occupation years. So uh, I didn't know that it was so relevant. We, we bought it just to commemorate this poet that had been murdered in Auschwitz. But now we understood it was from the period itself. Later on, I contacted uh, Michon's daughter uh, in Paris. I went to visit her and she showed me that you know, all kinds of, uh, like here, a book that had been signed by Fondan that he dedicated to Michon, so they were friends. And uh, also, I looked at works from the same period, and um, from 42, 43, uh, no, from 43, sorry, from 43, and you can see it's the same paper, it's the same attitude, it's the same style. So it was easy to, to uh, date the portrait to 1943, also because Michon's uh, only came back from captivity in, in the end of 42, so December 42, so it makes that the portrait must have been uh, drawn in, uh, the, in 1943. Now, it's interesting that this portrait is not the only portrait of Fondan. Uh, lots of artists uh, were found inspiration by Fondan and made his portrait. And you can see so Brancucci, and you can see Man Ray uh, in different, different series of, of works. And um, so here, and, and also Victor Braune, all of them are from Romanian origins. And what is really striking in this, uh, both the portrait by Man Ray and both, and the portrait by Victor Braune, both uh, in both Fondan is beheaded, uh, which is very, you know, um, unbelievable when you think that it was done in the 30s and, uh, oh no, even before. And, and when you know that uh, Fondan was murdered um, later. So, so this is really uh, something quite unbelievable. But what uh, we realized was that uh, the portrait by Michon was the last portrait of Benjamin Fondan. And just to remind you, I was working at the time on the exhibition Last Portrait, Painting for Posterity. And so while working on this exhibition, I found the last portrait of Benjamin Fondan, uh, because it's from 1943, and he was uh, uh, arrested and deported uh, to Auschwitz in 1944. So uh, these are really the amazing stories that happened to us during our work. And um, uh, we said uh, the next step is to display and to share the knowledge. So here you can see how uh, we also used um, the poem of Benjamin Fondan. In this case, only a, only uh, a part, part of it, not all of it. Uh, and for the first time, the portrait of Benjamin Fondan was shown to the public, and it was uh, in Berlin at the Deutsches Historisches Museum. Uh, Bettina, you mentioned the exhibition. You can see how uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel is uh, moved by the text because also uh, just read these amazing verses uh, that close, that conclude the poem, remember only, and you can read it in German, of course, remember only that I was innocent. And just like you mortal on that day, I too had a face marked by rage, by pity and joy, quite simply a human face. And this, and, and you know, remember only I had a face and we discovered his last portrait. Uh, and now, and with this story, I am concluding because I know we run a bit uh, late. Um, Felix Kasowitz was an artist from um, Budapest, active in Budapest, one of the pioneers in the field of uh, cartoons uh, in and animated movies in Budapest. And he was taken to forced labor 
And uh, he managed to send to his wife and a son, Peter, who stayed in Budapest, he illustrated postcards and all uh, uh, 25 postcards. And each of them is filled with um, love and optimism and hope. And uh, you can see here this uh, postcard he made for his son, Peter, who wanted to become an astronaut, and he says you can see the star in the same way, uh, meaning that they can look both at the stars and think of each other. Uh, now, um, against all odds, the three of the all three of the family survived, even though uh, Kasowitz was sent to Matthausen and um, uh, the, the mother of Peter. So. Um, uh, she was sent uh, to Ravensbrück, and Peter was in Budapest uh, in hiding, but all the three survived. And later on, we received these works to our collection. And now when we you remember our missions, because we said, uh, so to collect, to preserve, um, to research, uh, to display, and to share. So another example of how we can share uh, the 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 knowledge and the story yes thank you thank you to benita for moderating um i want to thank lena and margaret who you can see on camera we we have our little gin tonics here that we uh, have at the end of every session uh, i have water it's our last <laughs> session today we decided to come clean and to wish you all good time <laughs> Uh, may Eden. I was getting this, but <laughs> and, and, uh, May Eden. It means it's uh, Eden water. So it's the you know it's the water from paradise. Okay. Well, enjoy. Well, we enjoy our gin tonics. Thank <laughs> you all so much for participating. We don't know yet what our program next year is going to look like, but we hope you'll be part of it. And uh, do sign up to our newsletter or become a member and stay close to us. We love having you with us and we want to continue with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth and Bettina. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ah, René. Bye. Bye. Wonderful to see you. Wonderful to see to... you. Great to listen to you, like always. <laughs> Thank Great you very seeing much. you after so many years. <laughs> yes, you have been there to our show Survivors as well, but you couldn't make it, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. right. Take care, everyone. Stay safe, yeah? Good. Please stay safe. <laughs>